Hey guys, today I'll be tackling some of the biochemical details of the signalling system activated by the plant hormone cytokinin. In the 1950s, a small molecule was characterised that was present in autoclave DNA that could induce cell division, or cytokinesis, when it was applied with auxins to cultured tobacco pith cells. And this kinetin molecule was later classed as a cytokinin from cytokinesis. So for biological roles, there's actually a whole bunch, but I figured I'd just pick three. First one I've already really tackled, and it kind of illustrates a key point about how cytokinin and auxin signaling are often intertwined. Um, the second point, apical dominance. Apical dominance is whereby the growth from the main shoot is preferred or favoured over that from uh, embryonic lateral buds. And so cytokinin actually can stimulate these lateral or axillary bud outgrowths, which is antagonistic to um, auxin signaling. And the final point here is that cytokinins can actually also increase sink strength, and this has been shown in rice and barley, and it's also stress dependent as well. The parent molecule cytokinins is adenine with substituents that can be added to the N6 atom, as shown here with kinetin, which was the molecule derived from the autoclave DNA experiment, but also with transiatin, which was the first discovered naturally produced cytokinin which has an isopentanyl group ligated to nitrogen 6. You can also have aromatic cytokinins, for example, in the case of 6-benzalaminopurine, shown here. Moving on to synthesising a cytokinin, I'm going to look at transiatin specifically, and we need, first of all, the adenine base from ATP or ADP. ATP is just shown here for simplicity. And we also need an isoprene unit. Now, there are two routes we can get an isoprene unit in plants. We can either use the most commonly used pathway, which is a methyl erythritol pathway, or we can use a mevalonate pathway using acetyl-CoA as a building block. Then we need to ligate this activated isoprene unit onto nitrogen 6 of adenine, as shown here, which is catalyzed by isopentanyl transferases, or IPTs. However, the product of the reaction isn't exactly what we want. We first of all need to hydroxylate the isoprene unit with a cytochrome P450 enzyme, and then we need to cleave off the phosphate groups and then cleave the bond between the nitrogen of the adenine and the ribose sugar using a log enzyme or a lonely guy enzyme. And this finally creates our cytokinin transiatin and also ribose 5-phosphate. Moving on to looking at regulating cytokinin levels in the plant by catabolism, we're going to start with cytokinin oxidase enzymes. Now these are FAD utilising enzymes, so they use the oxidising power of FAD to break the bond between nitrogen 6 and the carbon atom of the isoprene unit. Now these enzymes are substrate specific which means the reaction won't work for things like 6-benzalaminopurine as a cytokinin. And what's also important with these enzymes is the different isozymes the plants have. So Arabidopsis has seven CKX enzymes with one vacuolar and two extracellular just to illustrate the fact that there's also subcellular localizational differences between the different isozymes. You can also change the activity of cytokinin by adding groups onto various functional groups. For example, we have N-glycosylation on N7 or N9, shown here, and this is considered irreversible, i.e. there's no reversing enzyme that's been discovered yet. You can also glycosylate the oxygen group on the isoprene unit circled now, and this creates a storage form, i.e. the glycosylated cytokinin can then be deglycosylated by glucosidases to revert it back to its active state. Although the enzymes for synthesis, log and IPT, are widely expressed in plants, it's thought that long distance transport is very important for communication between organs in different parts of the plant. For example, transiatin riboside, which is before log cleavage, is found in the xylem and used for shootwood transport to communicate nitrate availability and coordinate it with the shoot growth. However, isopentanyl adenine, which is without the hydroxylation on the substituent side chain of adenine, is transported in the phloem and goes rootwards. Focusing now on the short distance transport, we need the cytokinin to cross the plasma membrane and then the ER membrane into the ER lumen because the cytokinin receptors have a ligand binding site in the ER lumen. And for this, we need the plasma membrane transporters, which are PUP or purine permease, which occurs in a proton coupled manner. And we may also need these ENT proteins. However, to cross the ER membrane, we don't think we need a transporter. It can just pass through the membrane itself. 
Cytokinin signaling uses a two component system, which is seen often in bacterial environment sensing. And so here we have a classic example with an inactive dimeric histidine kinase receptor. It becomes activated by its ligand, the green box, and this causes transphosphorylation of the receptor of a histidine residue. Now, transphosphorylation means one monomer will phosphorylate the other monomer. Now, this phosphate group on the histidine will be transferred to a receiver domain on a response regulator protein on the spartate residue. And often this will be coupled to a functional response. For example, in this case, the receiver domain is next to a DNA binding domain and the transfer of the phosphate will then activate the DNA binding domain to allow it to bind DNA. Now for some plant specific detail, Arabidopsis has three histidine kinase receptors, AHK2, 3 and 4. They use a chase domain to bind a cytokinin and this binding is in a pH dependent manner, which is quite important given that the receptor ligand binding domain is in the ER lumen and the endomembrane system of plants also has a pH gradient going through it. The affinity for these receptors for cytokinin is in the order of 1 to 10 nanomolar. This is equivalent to the endogenous levels we see in vivo and the specific receptors show preference for different cytokinins so this can provide specificity in the cytokinin response in a context dependent manner. These receptors functionally overlap, however, in one specific response, one receptor might be more dominant in the function than the other two. However, if you knock out all three in these triple mutants, they're actually dwarfs and have a lower number of stem cells and meristems. This indicates the importance of cytokinin for later growth stages and also in stem cell pool maintenance. If you look at the expression levels of these different receptors, you find them mainly in the meristematics, tissues and vasculature. However, you do also find them ubiquitously throughout the plant, just at lower levels. And the receptors also show some specific distribution depending on which receptor you're looking at. For example, AHK4 is mainly in the root. Here's a schematic of the Arabidopsis receptor. So starting from the N-terminus and going to the C-terminus of each monomer, you see that there's a transmembrane helix and a ligand binding domain, then another transmembrane helix, so there's two transmembrane helix proteins. Then C-terminal to that, there is a histidine kinase domain, which also contains a histidine to be phosphorylated in trans. And at the very C-terminus, there are some receiver domains. There's actually two, I just chose one because it's easier to put on a diagram, and these receiver domains contain aspartate residues, which will eventually have a phosphate group put upon them. Now tracking the signaling, we now see that there is binding of the cytokinin, there's a conformational change in the receptor to favour the kinase over the phosphatase, they lead to a phosphorylated histidine residue on the receptor itself, there is then a transfer of that phosphate from the histidine to the aspartate within the receptors in those receiver domains at the C-terminus as I previously showed, and then there is transfer of that phosphate to histines on histidine containing phosphor transfer proteins or AHPs. These are the intermediary proteins of phosphorylase. These AHPs are continually shuttled between the cytoplasm and the nucleus regardless of phosphorylation state. And so overall, cytokinin activity leads to an increase in the proportion of these AHPs that are in the nucleus in a phosphorylated state. Now we've got these AHPs in a phosphorylated state in the nucleus, what can we do with them? Well, within the nucleus, there are also some response regulators called ARRs. Now type B ARRs contain an autoinhibitory receiver domain and MIB-like DNA binding domain. So this is the classical response regulator protein, it's a transcription factor, and the receiver domain is normally inhibiting the DNA binding activity. So as we have a phosphate from the histidine on the AHP, as it's transferred to an aspartate on the type B AIR receiver domain, you then remove this inhibitory activity of the receiver domain, and this allows the MIB-like DNA binding factor to bind to DNA, and so allows the type B ARRs to alter transcription. There is another parallel system to this that has been recently discovered called cytokinin response factors and they act downstream of the AHPs in parallel to the type B ARRs. Focusing now on these type B response regulators, they are transcription factors that use the MIB-like DNA binding domain, and the other domain is a receiver domain containing the aspartate residue, which will have a phosphate group on it. 
There's 11 of these in Arabidopsis, however, only five have been functionally linked to a cytokinin response. Now, there's quite a lot of genes that are expressed in the cytokinin response, so I just sort of chose three. Um, there's ones involved in cytokinin signaling, there's ones involved in auxin signaling, again, illustrating the interplay between cytokinins and auxins, and there's also an additional raft of transcription factors that are induced, which create a secondary cytokinin response. Now, this has been exploited, or rather knowledge of the consensus sequence of these response regulator proteins has been exploited to create a synthetic reported line of cytokinin signaling, which is this TCS-GFP as the last point. And you can use this line to fluorescently identify cells which have active cytokinin signaling. In signaling systems, negative regulation is very important. And so here I'm going to tackle AHP6 first. AHP6 lacks a histidine residue that's conserved in other AHPs and therefore is unable to take part in the phosphorylase system and competitively inhibits AHP binding to activated receptors to steal that phosphate. Nitric oxide, a signaling molecule found ubiquitously in eukaryotes and also in prokaryotic metabolism, can nitrosylate conserved cysteine residues on AHPs to reduce their activity. The cytokinin transcriptional response will also act to reduce the levels of active cytokinin. This is through transcriptional activation of cytokinin oxidase and also conjugating enzymes. For type B response regulators, you also have regulation by degradation. So this is through polyubiquitination and then degradation in the proteasome. And for this, we need a substrate specific factor from the KMD family or Kiss Me Deadly family, and then the SCF E3 ubiquitin ligase complex. Finally, the cytokinin transcriptional response also activates type A response regulators, and these inhibit type B ARRs, as will be shown. So, type A ARRs. There are 10 present in Arabidopsis, and are reduced by cytokinin in two ways. Transcriptional induction by type B ARRs, and the transcripts take 10 to 15 minutes to become detectable. And also by stabilization in the phosphorylated form, which is present through the phosphorylase system that I've shown previously. Now, the mechanism of their inhibition could be through direct competition with type B ARRs, or it could be indirect through recruiting repressive factors. In conclusion, I tried to make a summary diagram showing this with cytokinin at the top and a phosphorylase system branching off into both cytokinin response factors, type A response regulators and type B response regulators. Now those type B response regulators cause the induction of several genes, including those that negatively regulate the system, creating negative feedback loops, including cytokinin oxidases and the type A response regulators. So moving topic slightly, I'm going to talk about hormonal crosstalk. There's actually quite a lot of hormones that I haven't put on here. I've just mentioned some what I thought were the most interesting too. In regards to auxins, in the root Mary stem, cytokinin signaling correlates with expression of auxin efflux transporter, which means that cytokinin signaling can change the distribution of auxins in that organ and therefore change auxin action. However, in a different part of the root, in the root transition zone, auxins increase cytokinin synthesis enzyme IPT5 by repressing its inhibitor. This is a really good example of auxin cytokinin crosstalk and how it's context dependent. Another interesting hormone is ethylene. Ethylene is actually really interesting because it uses also a two component system just like cytokinin. However, in this case, cytokinin and ethylene are linked because the effect of cytokinin, i.e. root growth reduction, is mediated through ethylene and both use two component systems. So the signaling actually converges on some response regulators, which can obviously allow some crosstalk. So thank you for listening. I hope the presentation in this table proves to be helpful. There's some reviews and papers in the description and my next video will be on auxins.